Hi. I think I have a uh, responsibility of prefacing this entry with um, an admission that it's going to be more revealing than it is going to be humorous. If you end up laughing, uh, that's great. But if not, well, it really wasn't intended as humor for the most part. Uh, I, I listen to comedians fairly often. At least I used to. When I wrote this script, I listened to them pretty often. Some of them are a lot of fun. And uh, I was listening to them because I loved laughing along with the stories they would tell. Others, I found, seem to end up preaching more than joking around. And I found them to be the more difficult to listen to, personally. Of the two variety, um, well, I really have an issue with myself that I'm taking after the latter more than I feel I'm taking after the former in the pieces that I'd been writing last year when I wrote this. <laughs> but then uh, that would be only one of the many many plethora of issues uh, with myself that I have, right? Okay. On to the more revealing. Um, have you ever invested yourself in something more than you probably should have? Like, uh, have you ever, have, uh, have you ever, like, uh, you know, found yourself just, just falling? Falling for someone, or falling for something, you know, just falling, just, just falling. And you fall so hard and for so long that you realize after a while that it's just you continuing to fall into a bottomless void of nothing but your own expectations. You just keep falling. There's no bottom that you're falling towards. Yeah, I want, I want to think that this is a common thing. I kind of need to believe that this happens to other people besides just myself. And I know it's selfish of me to think that it's only happening to myself, but damn, does it seem that way sometimes. Now, how do you stop that fall? How do you, how do you get out? Because even as an adult, with adult responsibilities and outlooks and understandings in life... And the crap you've been through, it is still impossibly hard to admit to yourself that the void you find yourself falling through is one of your own creation. But a lot of times, that, that's exactly what it is. And eventually you have to admit it. You need to face the reality of whatever your own psychosis is and come to terms with the reality of what's going on outside of your own little bubble of personal thought, feeling, and want, and despair, and pushing and striving towards a goal that is unique only to you. There are times throughout your life, or if you're older, you might have come to consider them as life events, I suppose. Um, it's when you take notice of something or get involved with something and you build that something or someone up in your mind so much and you go to incredible lengths of impassioned thought or feeling, at least in your own thought process, towards whatever or whomever that end goal is and you just keep going on pushing, prying, and there's just, there's just nothing in return. Um, it's like a, it's like a burning crush. Burning. Because it continues for so long. Burning because there seems to be no end to it. Because the crush has no intention, no thought, no obligation, and absolutely no responsibility to give you the slightest bit of of attention, no matter how upset you're making yourself about it. It could be a job. It could be a goal that you've set for yourself. Um, it could be trying to get your family back together in the case that maybe the family members have strayed and haven't seen one another in a long time. You still care about them. 
And you wonder if any of them happen to care about you anymore. It could uh, very well be one person that you desire throughout your life. Uh, someone you've spent years getting to know. And you wonder why isn't amounting to anything. And inside your reality, your perception, you know, you know, you know, you're the only one who cares about your concern or your interest or your desire, your goal, your crush, your love, your passion, your thoughts, your everything that you do to strive and work and fluster away at that final sliver of light that guides you day in and day out until it doesn't guide you anymore. Until you wake yourself up enough to realize that the entire pursuit was just you. One of your own intention. One of your own making. One of your own frustration and madness. And it is madness. Um, let's not kid ourselves. Hope is a form of madness, especially when what you want and work towards is never realized because the longer you wait and wish for something, the more of a chance it has of becoming not just a hope, not just a dream, but an obsession. And that's, that's part of the human experience. I don't think we are the only ones who feel it, though. Now, for example, I know that when I get home from work, the first thing that the two baby girl kitties want to do is go out onto the deck so they can jump up onto the roof and run around in a space that is as long and as wide as the house is, but without the walls in the way to slow their progress. They love it. And they cry for it if it takes me a while to get them out. They love it because to them, it's, it's freedom. I live in an area surrounded by busy streets, and I don't want them to get run over. So I keep them inside to keep them safe. Even if the busy streets weren't an issue... All of the houses around us have dogs that are outside all the time. And to avoid the cats getting eaten or beaten, I keep them inside where it's safe. But the roof, to them, that's freedom. And they want it every day. But they're also kind of both afraid to jump back down onto the deck themselves. It's something they want, it's something that they yearn for, but also something they have difficulty returning from when they've received their fix for the day. So I have to go up on the roof in order to carry them down, one by one. Now the first comes down. <laughs> While I'm getting the second, the first jumps up on the roof again, happy that we can all share their sense of freedom together. It's, it's actually adorable. It's very sweet. Now why do we do this, though? Why do we put ourselves into situations like this, where we yearn and yearn and hunger and starve for acceptance or attention or love or understanding or even involvement. Why? It's because it gives us something to hope for. So, I don't know. Something to maybe look forward to in our pointless, stupid, useless life. The seemingly never-ending churn or rut of life. And it gives us a reason to expect some imagined outcome, some uh, fantastic, incredibly, possibly heroic outcome that you spend weeks coming up with, repeating over and over in your mind as the be-all and end-all of what would satisfy your hunger. It's a fairy tale ending that you strive for, even while knowing it's not something that will ever happen. And it'll never happen... Because you don't have luck like that. <laughs> you know, things don't work out perfectly for you, or how you intend or plan for them to work out. But at least it's something that gives you a reason to get up in the morning and trudge to wherever it is you have to go every day. It's something you cling to, desperately. Until some other distraction or necessity or need or entity maybe, I don't know, something like that, comes along to relieve you of the need to hold on to your focus and takes you off in another direction. I was the second child in the family. 
My sister was almost six years old when the family was blessed with my presence, and she never let me forget that I was the one who took her parents away from her. Yeah. She never let me forget that her life was absolutely perfect until I came along. Because by the time she was almost six, well, she had already grown comfortable in her idea that she was going to be an only child. As I grew up and went through school and entered adulthood, everything I've ever been able to do, uh, she could do better. And in my mind, she was the golden child to my parents. She could do no wrong. Uh, me, on the other hand... Well, I felt that I couldn't do much right in their eyes. I look back, and I remember only one time where my sister was spanked as a child. Maybe two. Maybe two if I think about it. Um, of the one I remember, well, I was spanked that night too. Kind of seals the memory. <laughs> I don't remember what the spanking was over, but uh, it was there. I guess it was just a bad day for my parents, right? <laughs> But me? I faced punishment more often than she did. I faced the wooden spoon, slapping me on the ass on multiple occasions, though my parents would deny it now. I faced being thrown on the floor in anger and outright resentment. I faced being slapped on the face by both parents. I remember being thumped on the head, pinched, kicked. <sighs> Hell, I remember being thrown through my bedroom wall because I made a crack at my mom that I didn't realize was going to mean what she took it as. And I deserved the rage against me that time. Now, um, presently, any one of those things would have been considered an abuse of parenting. Back then, we called it something different. We called it discipline, and though I might have been scarred by it emotionally, may have been wrecked by it psychologically, when I think of just how well I've done in my adult life and the lack of respect I've shown to too many people, uh, I should have been better too. I'm not entirely sure I received enough of it. I faced groundings, back when groundings meant something, you know, back when groundings were considered torture, <laughs> when you were locked in your room with all of your stuff and couldn't go outside for days or weeks. It was emotionally torturous, because outside was the place to be, at least for me. And if you were lucky like I was, you had a window overlooking the front of the house and could see all of your friends out having a great time without you. It's like you didn't matter to them. Meanwhile, I was in my room, alone, wishing that I could have a friend or two over to pass the time with. Uh, it was a humbling understanding even then. Even at a young age, getting the hint that I found my friends more important to my life than they apparently found me to theirs. And that's probably just a boo-hoo statement, right? But uh, we were kids. And you can't be angry over anything a kid does, because they're just learning about the world for the first time. And it took me a long time to realize that. I faced that I wasn't all that great at the things I wanted to be great at. I faced the realization that I was only one single entity in a world of billions of others, and that no matter how loudly or proudly I boasted about anything I would ever do, ever do, or ever accomplish, no matter how good it made me feel for the moment, I would never be the best, because there was an entire population of people, other people, just like me, competing for the top spot. So, uh, very humbling realization at a young age. And it got bad. It got really bad. It got bad enough that I knew I was in trouble because I started repeating the same lines over and over again everywhere I went. And once you start repeating yourself, it's time to admit and understand you have a problem. Now, once you start repeating yourself, it's time to understand that you have a problem. And those problems don't go away. They just fade into the background for a while, waiting to rear their ugly head again at the most inopportune moments. Look, we are all in this world together. And no matter what you do, no matter how hard you work, only one person at a time can ever reach the top spot of whatever you're reaching for. In the end, 
I had to understand that there was figuratively no chance that I would ever be that one at any one point for any one goal, let alone the for all time that I imagined my greatness to extend over. I was only one person out of the many. And no matter how amazing I worked to perform at any given thing, I was still just that one single entity. One single entity in the grand scheme of things meant that realistically, um, I was nothing. I was, I was nothing. And I grew to understand that the only salvation and expectation was to just chug along existing until my number came up and it was time for me to leave this world. This beautiful world. This world that became beautiful without any assistance from myself. That's, that's how important to the grand scheme I was. And it sounds bleak as hell looking at life that way. Um, I've heard uh, psychologists claim, though, that the best way to enter a healing state emotionally is by first hitting rock bottom. And you can't get much lower than you are when you feel like you amount to less than zero. When I was a kid, I was taken from the world for a bit. Just a bit. And when I was taken, I gained a new appreciation for life. I also gained a different view of the world than I'd had before, and that view has stuck with me. To this day, I am the only one that I know who thinks the way I do, and it drives me crazy. It makes me feel incredibly alone all the time. At the time I was taken, I was given a choice of coming back or continuing to rest. Every time I was presented with that option, and there have been a few times, I chose to come back. And from here, um, from rock bottom, I, I often wonder why I did. Why keep coming back? I can attribute some of that to the madness that hope brings. Now, the first time I was given the choice, making the decision I did was a no-brainer. I was a kid. I had no idea the significance behind the choice I was making. I just wanted to get back to playing, get back to friends, to popularity, to attention, because I was... One of the most popular kids around back then. Something that was about to change dramatically. I didn't realize I was going to come back looking like I'd been hit by a bus, because... <sighs> well, that's almost what happened. I just, uh, I just wanted to get back to living. But if I chose to come back... There were, there were a few things I had to agree to. A few people I had to eventually encounter. And as I grew up, the faces of those people became clearer in some instances. In others, the faces faded away into distant memory as I understood more and more the reality of my own situation, the bleak atmosphere of my given location. That location compared to the rest of the world, along with the financial shortcomings that my Early choices led to, which completely restricted travel to far-off lands. <sighs> but, uh, I did get to a few places. My dad. My dad, full of hopes, dreams, passions. My dad, also full of frustration, because by the time I was born... He no longer lived in a state where any of those passions or dreams could be easily reached. My dad. This man whom I grew up scared to death of. This same man whom I had learned the definition of physical pain from in the forms of beatings. Was a guitar player and singer. At one point in his young life, he lived in the same neighborhood as the kids who would become the Beach Boys. He was already into music back then. And I can only guess that seeing his childhood friends become the stars they were helped propel him forward to his own dreams of musical harmony. 
and while pursuing those dreams during the first half of my life, he was in a series of bands. Back then, advertising was different than it is today, as in no internet. It was through word of mouth, and largely from poster board advertisements in music stores, gig listings in newspapers, sending out physical copies of demo tapes, and stuff like that. <laughs> it was different than advertising now. People growing up these days wouldn't be able to comprehend it, honestly. Um, it was a different form of advertising and communication for a very different world. A less uh, complex world. It was a world that was more community-oriented than it was globally-oriented. The internet wasn't around for standard consumers uh, yet. The entire world wasn't open for easy communications at that time. Now, because he was in a band, and because he wanted those bands to be the best they could be, he would listen and practice music constantly. <laughs> and boy, did I grow to hate popular music completely. Yeah. I wasn't even in the band, and I was hating their selections of tunes like I was. If you ever listen to interviews with popular groups, they will sometimes admit that their most popular song is the one that they least like performing, because they've heard it a million times, inside and out, backwards and forwards. They've dissected it to bits in order to get the best sound out of it for their audience. But they still play it, because it was the powering force behind, uh, well, affording their mortgage. Uh, but, but I learned to hate popular music completely. Because the types of bands that my father was in were all cover bands, which meant they played anything that was already overplayed on the radio. I hated it. Hated it. But this was his creative outlet. And since my only goal in life, even from a young age, was to be a creative and entertaining sort myself, I, in my childlike, idiotic manner, respected what he was trying to do. A little. A little. Respected it, mind you, even though I couldn't stand it. <laughs> no. And when it came time for them to rehearse, or record in the house, they insisted on silence from the rest of the family members. That makes sense. I do the same thing with my recording. And because I was a kid that needed to be heard. That loved making a ton of noise. That didn't do anything besides piss me off and put me off music even more. Fine for me, I guess. My sister and I got older, as people do. In time, he inducted her into the band as a backup singer. Well, she loved to sing. She knew the words to every single song on the radio, too, because uh, she was one of those types of people who could listen and have a ton of things going on in the background, and still get her work done just fine. And actually, she preferred it that way. It's great for her, but uh, that wasn't me. See, when I was in work mode, I, I wanted silence. I wanted silence because silence is golden, and, well, that is how I wanted my work to shine as, like, you know, like gold. A few years later, she moved out, moved on. And he inducted me into the band, too. But unlike the golden child to him, um, I wasn't good enough to be heard. Nope. I was stuck with the grunt work of being the band's roadie. Not good enough to sing, but good enough to carry all the equipment in and then make myself scarce, unseen in the back of the room while the band played. Oh, I was good at making myself invisible. <laughs> so this role uh, did suit me well. It wasn't a difficult job either. See, I didn't know the first thing about setting the equipment up, so most of it was just unpacking and then packing back up and stuffing the stuff into the van. And when it came down to uh, what was happening, uh, my dad, as much as I was afraid of him when I was young, and as competitive as he was against his own son for the spotlight as I grew older, uh, at least he was bringing me along with the intention of he and I spending some time together. And it took me a long time to understand that this was what he was doing, since it wasn't something he would immediately admit. It also wasn't something I could even possibly see from a standpoint of a kid. And when I look back now, uh, it wasn't all bad. 
Well, the music was bad to me, <laughs> for sure, because I'd grown to hate anything popular. And that continues on even today. But the smiles of the faces of the people who were listening in while they played and the fun they were having while I was invisible in the background and they were dancing before me uh, and it demonstrated it was good. Even from the removed standpoint of not enjoying the music being played, I could see that others did enjoy it. And in that, I could see that my father and the bands he was in played the good sound. Now, because I was a roadie, I was dragged along on all of the gigs. And a lot of times, the gigs seemed like they were going to happen in really cool places. Until reality set in, and I found out they weren't. <laughs> yeah. On his tours, he took me to a few places, and in hindsight, I should count myself as lucky that he did. For example, he took me to Cleveland. His band booked a gig in Cleveland, and he brought me along. I was excited, because I had never been to Ohio before. I didn't even know if there was really anything to do there, but I was willing to find out. Except, uh, it wasn't in Ohio. We got into the van in Portland and went to Cleveland and Washington. Not nearly as far as I thought we were going to travel. That was different. Disappointing? Uh, maybe. Again, this was before the internet was a thing. I didn't have the option to quickly look up relevant information uh, that was current about a far-off place. I could go to the library and look at books that were 30 years old to see what was going on then, but current? No. See, I didn't really know anything about the other Cleveland other than the name of the place. I didn't know if I was really missing out on anything overly exciting. But, let's see, this was the start of a little pattern, and it was a pattern that I didn't immediately understand. Now, he told me we were going to see Chevy Chase. Back then, Chevy Chase was current. He was great. He was funny. And at the time, he was one of my favorite actors, comedians, but it turned out that he meant the city Chevy Chase in Maryland. And that wasn't nearly as funny as the person I thought he'd been talking about was. He told me we were going to Roswell, and that afterwards we were going all the way to Jupiter. This one, I could already tell was fake because it sounded like he'd set up a scenario for me to be kidnapped, and my mom, at least, uh, wouldn't put up with that, I hoped. Me, being a bit of a space monster buff, though, was excited about the chance to maybe see something. But we didn't, because it turns out that he wasn't taking me to Roswell in New Mexico, but took me all the way to Roswell, Georgia, instead. And after that, we headed over to Jupiter in Florida. More than disappointing let me tell you. Finally, I thought one of his bands had hit it big. He took me to New York. And when we got there, it was busy, as I expected it would be. It turns out, uh, <laughs> we were in West New York in New Jersey. Luckily for him, the place was so packed with people that I was too busy watching where I was stepping to have a chance to complain about the situation. Now, um, a year before this, my parents had taken me and my best friend on vacation. During that vacation, we ended up going to Las Vegas and some other places, too. My friend and I, at the time, were only 16 years old, but found that we could easily get into any place we wanted, despite an age restriction, so long as we looked and acted like we were supposed to be there. Security was a little more lax back then, as you can imagine. And we stayed in Vegas for a week during that trip. And since my parents had adult things they wanted to do, my friend and I had pretty much the run of the city to ourselves. And we had a ball. So when my dad told me we'd booked a gig in Las Vegas, well, you can expect that I was thrilled to go. But in another turn of not where I thought we would be going, we ended up doing a show in Las Vegas, New Mexico. It wasn't quite the same thing. Next up was a real slap in the face, because it had me thinking again that one of his bands had hit the big time. One day, <clears throat> after school, he took me aside and told me that we were headed to Beverly Hills for a show. And this guy had to have 
He had to have seen the excitement in my eyes when he said that. He had to see the excitement of this kid who he'd fooled over and over by then, this this stupid kid that kept thinking that something was going to happen, that hope beyond hope that this time, this, this time, it would be something good. Now, the drive was a long one, and since I'd grown accustomed to a trip down I-5 from Portland to L.A. taking about 20 hours when I was a kid, I realized about 20 hours in that we were headed somewhere else. <laughs> Now, the show was in Beverly Hills, all right. Beverly Hills, Michigan. I was getting so tired of the bamboozle. <laughs> My God. When he told me we were headed to Kokomo for a Shokomo, I was skeptical. The Beach Boys, his childhood friends, had done the song Kokomo just a few years before that. It was a hit. It was their last hit. It depicted a beachfront, a place to get away and enjoy the sun. My dad had a smile on his face as we went on our way. It was a reassuring smile, and almost set me at ease. But after all the build-up that the song Kokomo promised, I never expected it to be a stupid place in Indiana. And we booked shows in Paris, Tennessee, and in Cairo, Missouri. I wasn't fooled either of those times, though, because I knew we weren't going to be setting out across the ocean in the band's travel van. Finally, I'd had enough. <laughs> Can you blame me? He'd taken me from location to location to places I thought we'd be going, and I was wrong every time. I was tired of it. I said, Dad, what is the deal? Why do you keep dangling these vacation dreams in front of me for them to just turn out to be places I would never visit in a million years? <sighs> And he looked at me. He looked at me. This man whom I'd grown up with. This man whom I'd never thought had been incredibly impressed with me. And shook his head. And he answered me. You don't get it, he said. And I didn't. I didn't get it. All I could do was look at him and shake with rage at being brought to yet another lousy blip on the map of the country. And he looked at me and said, All your life, you tried to do nothing but be creative. And he was right. This guy that I thought knew nothing about me was right for a change. He looked at me and said, You look forward to your future. And the only option you see is something creative, something stupendous, something that will get you fame fortune and all the attention that you don't get in your life anymore thanks to being the kid that came back from the dead. And the words shook me. I was angry. I was humiliated. I was too human at that point not to be. I looked down in shame. I hated hearing the words that I'd been thinking myself for years by then. See, it's one thing to think them, to keep the misgivings over the idea's bottled up inside, where they eat away at your confidence and your conscience until neither are anything worth consideration anymore. It's entirely different, though, to hear them coming from someone else. And he placed his hand on my shoulder. It probably wasn't as reassuring as he'd intended the gesture to be. Adam, he said, it doesn't matter how creative you are. So long as you start with something, start working for something or on something. And I looked up at him then. Dad, what are you talking about? And he said, son, I've not just been taking you to these gigs all over because we've been getting them. I've been taking you to these particular ones because they're in places you wouldn't expect. Huh? And he laid it out for me. Look, he said. You don't have to be incredibly creative for big things to happen in your life. These places we've been going to aren't just ideas. They are cities. They're not just points of nothing on the map. They are places where groups, communities of people live and learn and work and smile and thrive and live and love and weep and die. Sure, they aren't creatively named at all, but even though they aren't, they were still started. 
They started and grew as something, even if their names were known for something bigger. And I was dumbfounded. Dead silent. These places may not seem creative, son. But they are something. Because somebody did start them. Even the most non-creative beginnings can grow into something. And in these cases, they got big enough to be more than just random plans. They're going to be cities of their own. And when I think back to that moment now, I look back at my life and at the things I've tried to do to become successful. I tried to become a writer. And in so doing, wrote a few novels. Because, uh, well, to become a writer, you can't just go to an agent and announce that you're going to be a writer and demand they hire you. No, you've, uh, you've got to write something to get noticed. Maybe even a few things to get noticed. And then, you've got to send very specifically arranged letters to different agents to see if anyone thinks you're good enough to represent. Now, these actions mean a lot of time taken for everyone... And in my case, it didn't go anywhere. I tried to be a singer. My dad wasn't too impressed with the music I sang and wrote, because... Well, what he sang and wrote was a different style than mine. See, I hated every popular song there was out there. And that was a great way to alienate my style from what the public liked to hear. I didn't, I didn't get that, though. I got really, really fond of opera and show tunes because they are both things my father wouldn't touch with a ten-foot pole. I couldn't play an instrument to save my life, but I could handle vocal percussion like a boss. I wasn't singing along with the music because in everything I wrote, I was the sole source of the music. And we know how much the public loves listening to acapella. <laughs> it's pretty niche. Um, I tried to be an artist. But drawing pictures doesn't get you noticed very easily unless you're amongst the best. I was good when I put my mind and time to it, but again, I wasn't the best out there. And as you grow into adulthood, you find yourself with less and less time to develop a true masterpiece. And now when I look back at my old masterpieces, I see only rookie mistakes over over analyzing I guess I tried to be an actor I even got cast in a movie and soap opera but uh, that's as far as it went I never saw the movie and as far as I know the soap opera never even aired I uh, I tried to become a magician I was good I really thought I was good the competition in the area was unexpectedly fierce I spent thousands of of dollars learning the trade. Didn't pan out. Well, the most I get now is that I should go gamble in Vegas. Yeah, it's a great idea. And if the tables would let me handle the entire deck, I'd win every time. They don't do that, though, unless you're the dealer. <laughs> I'd wanted to be uh, a voice actor since I was maybe three or four years old. I love the idea of it. But I didn't realize it was an actual job until I was older. As an adult, I got properly trained. I took courses on it. I learned the industry not just from my teachers, who are all well-known within the voiceover professional world, but also from working towards getting known myself. I got a great setup. I got the demo and paid good money for it to be directed and produced. I got the booth, because home studios are now a necessity for up-and-coming artists looking to get attention in the industry. Um, I probably spent a good 10000 on the attempt. And at the moment, I've been booked into commercials around the world. Yeah. Yeah, I've been heard around the world, but the return has been very minimal in contrast to the investment. Because like every creative endeavor I've thrown my hat into throughout my life, i found that again, there's always one more thing you can buy to make yourself look or sound better. There's always one more step you can take to make yourself seem more professional or produce a better product. 
It's an unending cycle of chasing the idea of having just one more thing to put you over the top. But my dad had a point. A place may not be creatively named, but that didn't mean the place didn't exist. I might not be the best at anything I try to do, but when I do try to do something, a product is produced. It does exist. These places were places. These destinations, not necessarily creatively named, were absolute locations that people from all walks of life looked toward as their place to be, their place to work towards something in their life, whether it be a brighter future, or like I do, to just keep existing and holding onto the madness of hope, waiting for a brighter day. We live in a country that is home to studios that gush creativity. And that is a form of inspiration for creatives of every age. But at the same time, we live in a world that is in dire need of spreading more creativity around. My day job, on the non-creative side of my life, is in legal. I see cases from all over the world, but the majority of them are from right here in the USA. I was taken aback then when I noticed that every single stupid state seemingly had the same cities in them. I'll tell you right now that you're never going to see a place named bullshit. <laughs> you will find a hell. You will find a hell. You'll also find that, uh, since hell's in Michigan, that sometimes hell does freeze over. You will find an accident in Maryland. You can even find a coupon in Pennsylvania and me telling you about the coupon has indeed saved you time for having to look it up yourself. And everyone knows that there's a boring in Oregon. I mean, I live there. They could have named the whole state boring and been right on the mark. <laughs> so uh, some city or town names can be on the creative, unexpected side. But then you have the less creative. You can have a city name that, if you tell someone that's where you are, narrowing down your general location isn't as easy. Portland? Newport. Salem, anyone? They're all common names of cities you'll find in other states. Springfield? <laughs> Good old Springfield. If I tell my buddy that I'm in Springfield, he'd probably think of the one outside of Eugene close to home. He would probably be wrong, though, because there's a Springfield in almost every state in the nation. 35 states have a Springfield in them which makes the name one that just bursts with creative disappointment. But if I want to throw someone off from my location, I can be even more obscure than that because there is a Riverside in 46 states. You could give someone your real city and still be able to hide from them for the rest of your natural life. If I don't want to seem like an ass and don't want to confuse someone as much, I could say that I was in Centerville, which can be found in 45 of the 50 states. So, just a little easier to find. Again, the places may not be creatively named, but they are successful because they've grown from mere ideas to real places. I found the balance between creativity and success to be uh, something of a tug of war. And we're all aiming for success because we don't want to live with our parents for the rest of our lives and they don't want us to live with them <laughs> now we aim for success because we want to feel good about ourselves and stand strong with the knowledge that we've made it that we can do it on our own but probably mostly because we really don't want to live with our parents for the rest of our lives but uh, following your passion your creative side is also a necessity in life in order to keep yourself sane. And if you can merge the two things, success and passion, you can die a happy person. Or, well, hopefully you'll get to retire a happy person before you die as a happy person pursuing your creative side, right? It's uh, something that I strive for. It's something that I honestly pray for. It's something that I long for. And something that I've looked forward to my entire life. I'm uh, 43 now. I was 42 when I wrote this. 
I still look forward to, uh, to it. I still put my foot forward and engage that creative spectrum when I've got the time and the opportunity. I still look to it for passion. And uh, even last year when I wrote this, at 42 year old, I look to it and I find it very elusive. Did you ever have one of those times in your life when you feel like you're so close to something? that you can almost taste it. I've felt that with my nature of artistry a number of times. I was close to getting somewhere with it, I tell you. I could almost taste it. Right now, the taste is slightly bitter, and I feel like I'm on the verge of starvation. But you've got to keep going, inevitably. That's my plan. So, uh, what are you dealing with here? Uh, you're dealing with a guy who likes to write. You're dealing with someone who likes to read, who likes to talk when given a chance. Because every word of this was written and uh, was read for this taping. Even the ums and ahs. You're dealing with a guy who uh, decided to put things together as a demonstration towards staying in character. You're dealing with someone who likes card manipulation. You're dealing with the obvious depression of a starving artist. <laughs> I realized over time that this was exactly what I'd been dealing with in the case of my father while growing up. He was a starving, extremely frustrated artist himself. Filled with dreams of success. Filled with talent. And hampered with the realization of the real world and what he had to do to deal with it. But he did deal with it, and he was successful at doing so. By concentrating on his reality, as well as his dream, he was able to afford a home, afford a family, and find some friends to play music with together. I've got dreams myself, but we all have dreams. Right now, I don't see those dreams coming to pass, but to keep myself going, even if I'm not smiling while in motion, I need to keep that dream alive. But I also need to deal with reality. And that's about all. In the end, tonight, you've been dealing with Adam. <laughs>